We'll be reading from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. Before we begin, let's pray. Dear God, we admit that we are sinners. We come to you this morning with open hearts, not just to hear, but also to learn from you, so we can continue to grow in spirit, preach your word, and also encourage others to join your church. In Jesus' name we pray. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all in all. But to, each, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the holy universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Diana, so much. Um, Please do keep the Bibles open there. And the question I want us just to think about for a few minutes this morning is how much of a big deal is unity? How much do we uh, value unity? How much do we... How much do we prize it? Uh, one of my favourite TV shows is the, uh, the West Wing. It's an American political drama. And there is one episode where one of the junior staffers has leaked very sensitive information to the press. And Toby Ziegler, who is the communications director and a man not normally given to a cheery demeanour, gathers all of the junior staffers together to, to let rip and to lay into them. But instead, he finds himself saying this, uh, we're a group, we're a team. From the president and Leo on through, we're a team. We win together and we lose together. We celebrate and we mourn together. And defeats are softened and victories are sweeter because we did them together. You're my guys and I'm yours. And there really is nothing that I wouldn't do for you. And that kind of unity, it's one of the great aspirations of the West Wing, and it's one of the great aspirations, I think, of our world. Uh, Maybe this is why John Lennon's lyrics resonate so much with us today. You may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you join us, and the world will be as one. John Lennon says, if only... If only we could be friends. If only we could be one. If only we could be united. We love the idea of unity. At the same time, unity is not something that we see that much of in our world, is it? The murder of George Floyd and ongoing race relations. 
COVID-19 and the ever-widening gap between rich and poor. Ukraine, Russia, ongoing conflicts in Sudan, Yemen, Syria, Ethiopia. We love unity. <coughs> and yet our world is as divided as ever. If only God had a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in the Lord Jesus. If only God was as obsessed by unity as we are. If only God was committed to reuniting this broken world that he made good. Uh, if you're looking in on Christian things this morning, wonderful to have you. Have you ever considered, I wonder, whether the local church is the answer to all of our longings for unity? Have you ever considered that? And if you're a Christian person here this morning, I wonder if you've ever realised what a massive part you have to play, whoever you are this morning, in this great plan that we long for to unite this fractured and dividing world that we live in. Two things this morning as we hit the big um, turning point in the book of Ephesians. And point one is a bit of a recap, I think, of the story so far. Let me have a look at, let me get you to have a look at 4 verse 1. This is the big turning point verse as we go from uh, the outline of the plan in chapters 1 to 3 to what it now means to get on board with this plan in chapters 4 to 6. And he says this, he says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. And the question is, well, what is the calling you've received? And the answer is everything that we've heard from chapters 1 to 3. This great plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in the Lord Jesus. And now he says, verse 1, live a life worthy of that plan. Verse 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit that has been achieved for you. Because what God has done in that church in Ephesus is amazing. Just come back with me to uh, 2.14. 2.14, black, white, rich, poor, Protestant, Catholic, Hutu, Tutsu. All of those divisions have nothing on the biggest division of the ancient world, the division between Jew and Gentile. It was the greatest divide that the world has ever seen. There it is. But 2.14 says that the barrier has been removed, the dividing wall, boom, has been smashed to pieces, and in the gospel there is peace, and the two groups have been made one. And now in this massively divided city of Ephesus, can you believe it? There is a local church where Jew and Gentile meet and have everything in common. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. I love seeing this in our world today. When you see two people who in any other context would have no reason to come together in Christ, united and sharing everything in common. I remember speaking on a student getaway not that long ago. One of the top athletes from the university going out for a walk with one of the geeky scientists from the university who would never be seen on a sports field. It's not that outside of Christ they would hate one another. It's just that it's only the gospel that could bring them together in friendship. I remember speaking on another church weekend away and seeing a homeless man talking and having breakfast with a university professor. Where else in the world do you get that? Here they were in Christ, one united. But the thing that really, I think, blows your mind in Ephesians is 3 verse 10, this is the last little uh, bit of context before we get into our passage. His intent 
was that now through the church, the wisdom, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. What has happened in that church in Ephesus? It's amazing. You, know, you would expect word to get out. You might credit it being known to the whole city, all their friends hearing about it. If you were being really optimistic, you might think the whole surrounding region would get to hear about what's happening in that church in Ephesus. Have you heard? Jew and Gentile united. Never in your wildest dreams, though, would you think, 3 verse 10? Never would you think that what is happening in that church matters because of what is going on in the heavenly places. As, as if 3 verse 10 on a big screen row upon row of spiritual being in the heavenly places are watching what's happening and on the screen God is displaying his wisdom and how does he display his wisdom 3 verse 10 through the church and so, so he shows a little uh, video maybe of a church in Rwanda some meeting from a Hutu background, some from a Tutsi background. United, one. And God says, look at what I've done. Next, the camera goes perhaps to a church in South Africa, some black, some white. Look at the camera. One, united. Look at what I've done, God says. And next, the camera goes to St Thomas's Oakwood on a Sunday morning. There's a guy called Rich Aldrich speaking. There are people there from Nigeria and China and Sri Lanka and France and Mauritius and Egypt and Scotland. Look at what I've done. Um, I never realised church was such a big deal. Do you get this? There is a we as well as a me in Christianity. And the book of Ephesians says the we is bigger than the me. The church is the place where God works out his plan. So 4 verse 3, make, not just some effort, make, make every effort to keep the unity that has already been achieved. Oh, because it's so easy, isn't it, for our differences to come between us? We're from different backgrounds. We're from different cultures. We have different interests. We have different tastes. We have different personalities. How easy it is for those differences to come between us and for us to exclude and criticise and to reject one another on the basis of those differences. And so Paul wants us to realise that despite all of those differences, we're one body. One people. There is an overriding unity. And once we see that, and once we realise what God's done, same body, well then it enables us, I guess, doesn't it, verse 2, to be humble and gentle and patient and to bear with one another. In a, in a world of division, the church is God's show and tell. One body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. But point two, verses 7 to 16, say that although unity is something that God has already achieved, actually it's still a work in progress. And this is where you and I come in, because how do you get on board with this great plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in the Lord Jesus? And how do you live a life that is worthy of this calling that you have received? And if you have a look at the, the flow charts on the screen there, it all starts, can you see in verse 11? which adds to Jesus' list of achievements in this letter. Okay, so already in this letter, Jesus has achieved leadership of the universe. And already, he has brought dead people to life in the gospel. People dead in their sins, through his death on the cross, forgiven, accepted, alive. Already, he smashed down the wall between Jew and and Gentile, and now the one who descended, the one who 
died and was victorious over sin and death, is also ascended, and the risen and ascended Jesus adds to his list of achievements, verse 11, by giving presents, by giving gifts. And what are the presents that he gives? Well, people. He gives apostles, it says there, like Paul here, who wrote this letter. He gives prophets like Daniel, who we're going to be uh, looking at on the church weekend away in a few weeks' time. And he gives, can you see there, pastor teachers, um, and, and the clue is in the title, isn't it? Pastor teachers, whose role it is to open up the Bible and to teach and to pastor. And you might look at me this morning and you might just think, well, what a rubbish present, Jesus. You know, what an average, hopeless present, Jesus. Could you have not given us a better gift than Rich Aldrich? You know, what a terrible pastor teacher. Could you have not given us a better present? And I am sorry about that. But the image here in verse 11 is really of me dressed in a bow, standing in a gift bag, leaping out the wrapping paper to deliver the sermon on a Sunday morning because why Jesus gives presents and the presents he gives are people and what do those uh, people do well verse 12 follow the logic through with me the aim of the pastor teacher the aim of the present verse 12 is to um, can you see that equip God's people uh, what do they equip God's people for? Well, look down for works of service. So what? Well, so that the body is built until what? Verse 13. Unity. What we're after. The end of the plan. And that is quite interesting, isn't it? Because verse 12 says that I am not your minister. Okay, do you get that? Verse 12, I am not your minister. I hope you realise that. I am not the minister of St. Thomas's Oakwood. But rather, my role, verse 12, is to equip the people of St. Thomas's Oakwood to be the ministers um, of St. Thomas's Oakwood. Can you see this? Um, I am your personal trainer. Okay, not your minister. I should be dressed in lycra, really. I, I am here to equip, and you, all of us, me and you, we are the ministers of St. Thomas's Oakwood. So, okay, fasten your seatbelts. Um, slightly provocative illustration, okay? I'm really sorry about this. I just want you to feel the force of this, okay? Provocative illustration coming up. Imagine if I decided Sunday morning, I am not going to bother coming to church. Um, fancy a lion, fancy a morning in bed. I've been invited to a party. Fancy a trip to being q to do some DIY. We get to the point in the service, we've had the reading. And then what happens, there is a pause. And we look around. Where is he? Um, I, I think you might think there was something a bit off about that, okay? Verse 12 says, actually, it's more of an issue if we're not there, because I'm not the minister. Do you get that? We're all the ministers of St. Thomas's Oakwood. I am just the personal trainer. Um, it really is dog collars all round. Me and the light crew, everyone in the dog collar. Because I am here to equip the people of St. Thomas's to be the ministers of St. Thomas's. Do we have a sense of being needed by other Christians? Do we have a sense of being part of a body? And actually a problem if part of the body is missing. And then moving towards the end of the, the flowchart there, the work of ministry... And the work of service, it's there, I think, in verse 15. And it's just worth, I hate doing this, but it's just worth noting that I'm not sure this is the, the best, I hate doing this, I'm not sure it's the, the, the most accurate translation, because verse 12 really should be in the singular, not the plural. It's work of service, not works of service. Which isn't, of course, to deny that the New Testament talks about loads of works of service that Christians are to be involved in in the local church. Everybody is valued. Everyone has a gift. But here in Ephesians, there is one work of service, okay, singular, and it's there in verse 15, 
And this is the thing that the personal trainer in the Lycra equips you for, because the big job of every Christian, verse 15, is to speak the truth in love so that we grow and become mature and reach unity. And of course, speaking the truth in love, it doesn't mean, you know, I go up to Chris afterwards and say, Chris, um, you've got really bad breath. Just speaking the truth in love. Um, gospel truth, okay? Truth, um, truth about Jesus. And it is something that we can all do. Everyone has this gift. You need your personal trainer to equip you. And then we just need to be Christian with one another. And we need to actually just, in a very normal way, that's not weird, just talk and apply Christian truth to one another. This is why it's brilliant that the older teenagers have their discussion group afterwards for 10 minutes um, in the chapel area at the back, because you've not really done church, and you've not had the Ephesian for completing the plan, bodybuilding experience, if there is not some measure of horizontal speaking the truth in love going on. How great that the older teenagers have their discussion time at the back, that little 10 minutes. This is why we have refreshments. It is nice to have a drink, and it's great that we offer hospitality, but really it's just a platform for doing verse 15, and an opportunity for us all to get on board with the plan for the cosmos to unite all things in the Lord Jesus. As we just chew and mull on the things that we've been hearing this is why we have home groups and Bible study groups during the week and why we try to say to everyone in the church family, be part of a small group. Be there. Make it a priority. Wouldn't miss it for the world because it's a platform to do verse 15 as we get on board with God's plan for the fullness of time to bring together a world that is hopelessly divided. And of course, it's not just Sunday, it's not just formal structures, it's a text, it's a letter, it's a friendship, it's a walk in the park, it's a drink in the pub. Do, do we have a sense of our need to give and to receive and to talk about gospel truth as a church? Do we have a sense of our need for relationships united with Jesus at the centre? Because as we do that, verse 13, what happens? We reach unity. We attain the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, which you will know is Ephesian language. We had it last week for the completion of the plan. Verse 15, we grow. Verse 15, we become mature. And verse 16, the whole body builds itself up in love. And even more than that, what's going on row upon row of spiritual beings in the heavenly places can't take their eyes off what is happening. They're already pretty amazed by what God has done. The camera goes to the church in Northern Ireland, some converted from a Protestant background, some converted from a Catholic background. Look at what I've done. The spiritual forces are already astonished. But next, God does show and tell on the screen with St. Thomas's Oakwood. Uh, camera goes uh, to the discussion group at the back, the older teenagers, in a few minutes' time. The camera goes to um, the hall and spilling out onto the grass. The camera goes to your home group and your, your Bible study group. And the spiritual forces, they, they're wetting themselves because God is showing his victory. They are begging him to turn it off. They are weeping and they are wailing. Because as we do this, as we speak the truth in love to one another, and as we just do church family together, it testifies. The plan is working. There will be unity in a world that is hopelessly divided. God is working out his victory. Have you ever realised how significant the local church is? Have you ever realised that what we do after church is the most important part of the morning? Have you realised that? Have you realised that I'm not your minister? I am in Lycra. 
in a world that is hopelessly united, God has a plan to unite all things in the Lord Jesus. Where is that plan happening? Well, in about five minutes' time, when our service finishes. Should we pray? Should we pray as we close? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this wonderful plan. We long for unity. We love unity. We are so heartbroken as we see the the divisions in our world. Praise you for the measure of unity that you have already achieved in our church family. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you might help us now, all of us, to get on board with this plan. That you might grow us, make us mature, more united, that body that you'd love us to be. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.